Aura 3 data, I think, was very impressive. Mm -hmm. um, and it told, it kind of a, is the icing on the cake of the story of osimertinib from phase one all the way to phase three. Uh, Jared, you know, we mostly think if drugs work better in the second line setting, they're going to work better in the first line setting. We do have some data on osimertinib in the first line setting. What, what's your perspective there? Well, I think there's a lot of uh, wind to the sails of that idea from the J. Alex data, which asked the same question with crizotinib, where mm -hmm. um, I think we were uh, surprised um, at just how much better the next generation ALK agent was than the first gen. It, it exceeded the preceding data. So we do have some actual data here. Um, we have uh, expansion phase one data from osimertinib in the front line that gave us a median PFS over 19 months yeah. and excellent safety data. Mm -hmm. um, that led to a randomized phase three trial of first gen versus third gen uh, treatment um, that I think is a very uh, appropriate and ethical trial, not only for the hopes of preventing resistance, but be in contrast to a lot of our other next generation uh, drugs. Historically, our next generation has been rougher than our first generation. Oh, yeah, this is, um, yeah. In contrast, osimertinib is a very specific and very well um, tolerated agent um, uh, compared to the first and second mm -hmm. generation uh, TKIs. So yeah, this trial offers the hope not only of preventing uh, the or delaying the emergence of resistance and maybe getting a longer PFS, a lot like what we saw in, in J. Alex for um, ALK, but perhaps also reducing toxicity along the way. These are not patients on treatment for a few weeks or a few months like we're used to thinking with chemo. These are patients who we may well be counting in years. Um, and so uh, that reduction in toxicity, particularly around diarrhea, uh, could be uh, rather relevant to quality of life. Yeah, so it's, it's the FLORA trial that uh, I think it completed it, it, its accrual and I think an important trial. But getting back to your point about, um, you know, what, what or actually a, a slightly different point. Jared mentioned the median PFS mm -hmm. in the first one being about 19 months in change. Um, how much? Right, and we get about we, we get about ten months for right. the first generation followed by the third generation. Are we ready to the, dismiss the, the first, generation? second generation? That that sequencing it brings up a lot of sequencing issues. We don't know, right? In right. Alk, in Alk, if you had added up the numbers, you would have expected from J Alex a hazard ratio of roughly 0.5, but we didn't. We got a whole lot better than mm -hmm. that. And so I think the key point for t thinking about this trial is we just don't know. It could be better, a lot like what we saw out with ALK. It could be the same, it could just be additive, or for all we know, we could be very wrong and it could be worse. Yeah. Well, we're looking at PFS, right? And I'm a little worried about with the effect on overall survival because it means we have less, you know, what is the resistance pattern going to be when people become resistant? And are we going to have fewer overall options? And will our overall availability yeah. of treatment not lead to as good an overall survival if we start with our best stuff? Alex, China. China. <laughs> yeah, and just to add another layer to this, to me, uh, an additional advantage of doing OC Mertinib in the first line setting is its CNS coverage. Um, and even at the 80 milligram dose, you can see significant intracranial disease control with OC Mertinib. So you have the additional element of preventing um, relapse in the brain or preventing the appearance of brain right. metastases, which is valuable. Yeah, and that's that's actually what I was going to come back to Tracy with with the next issue. Yes, I'm what, glad you brought that yeah. up. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. The, yeah. <laughs> yeah. the the Bloom trial that yeah. was presented at ASCO yeah. uh, this past year, um, there were two phases to that. One was the um, demonstration of efficacy in brain metastases of a new drug, um, EGFR TKI from AstraZeneca, that's designed to have better blood brain penetration. Um, but they also presented data on osimertinib dosed at twice the usual dose, 160 milligrams, in patients who usually we consider the worst of the worst. These were patients uh, with um, CSF-established leptomeningeal disease, a patient population that historically has only survived a couple of weeks. The treatments we have for these patients are terrible, either intrathecal chemotherapy or craniospinal radiation, neither of which work very well, and you're perfectly within your rights to not treat these patients right. that way and to refer them for comfort care. Um, they took 20 of these patients and they uh, gave them this uh, 160 milligrams of osimertinib and 12 patients were around and doing well 12 weeks later and seven of those pa patients were symptomatic, three of them had improvement in their symptoms yeah. and there was demonstrated efficacy. All these patients were positive for T790. So it looks very promising for the blood brain penetration for this agent and that we can salvage patients that we previously thought not salvageable. I have a patient who's actually just on standard 
different dose osimertinib, who's um, had her leptomeningeal disease controlled now for a year yeah. on this agent. So that's very impressive. It, it, yeah, it's certainly a huge unmet need. Mm -hmm, in, absolutely. In a, in a very frustrating clinical situation which patients are in. Right, and I think the first-line agents do have some efficacy in the brain. I've treated patients with first generation who have asymptomatic subcentimeter brain metastases. I've put them on erlotinib and, and seen responses. And then we've had, when people progress in the CNS, we've tried pulse dosing where people take um, 10 pills once a week to try yeah. to get the blood levels up for better blood-brain penetration. Um, but yeah, so we've, yeah. these agents are effective within the brain, which is exciting. Yeah, and then, and then Valley, I'd like you to comment on the uh, story with icotinib. Um, and we have uh, actually some randomized data to, uh, right. with the old standard of whole brain, which no one likes. This is uh, to augment the point that Tracy just made, that all these agents, even first-generation agents, have activity in the brain. And the study was comparing a standard approach to treatment of brain metastasis. Actually, out of these patients that were treated in this trial from China, about 20 percent, 16 to 20 percent, were symptomatic brain metastases. Mm. Uh, with the standard approach, which is radiation therapy and standard chemotherapy, versus uh, icotinib, which is a first generation EGFR TKI, and um, the end result of this trial the bottom line is that icotinib was better at every parameter that was looked at, including intracranial progression-free survival, um, overall progression-free survival, response rate of these lesions. The only thing that wasn't different, different was overall survival, which was we didn't really expect. So this uh, confirms what we have known but never had done a study for here in the U.S. or in uh, other countries that these drugs it, work it, better an, than standard therapy. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's an important study. Yeah. Um, and we really need to kind of engage our radiation colleagues mm -hmm. because so often we see them the knee-jerk reflex is to do whole brain radiotherapy. Right. Um, and this is a population that tends to have much longer survival. So the potential toxicity of whole brain is mm -hmm. more pertinent in that population. So I think it's uh, important. Uh, this has okay. been great. I mean, we're 13 years into EGFR mutations, and look where we've come in just a relatively short period of time. I want to switch gears.